Ukraine's decision to blow up bridges across the country was a key to fending off Russia in the early part of this war. Now, 79 days into the invasion, the battle for Ukraine is still being fought along the river's edge. A few days ago, satellite images picked up what appeared to be temporary pontoon bridges built by Russian forces along a river in northeast Ukraine. The Russians were believed to be trying to cross that river in order to try and surround tens of thousands of Ukrainian forces. The arrow you see on the map is the approximate location of where they were trying to cross. Today, British intelligence was able to confirm these aerial photos, first released by the Ukrainian military, showing the remains of a decimated Russian battalion along what remains of those pontoon bridges. Ukraine claims that as many as 1,000 Russian troops were killed in that attack. And while we cannot confirm those numbers, the New York Times reports that Russian troops have been repeatedly thwarted trying to cross the Seversky Donets, leading to heavy losses and slowing their already plodding advance. The loss of this Russian battalion is just the latest in a long series of blunders by Russia since the start of this horrific war. Today, a former commander of pro-Russian separatist forces in eastern Ukraine accused the Russian defense minister of criminal negligence over Moscow's military blunders. This comes as Ukraine kicks off its first war crimes trial of a captured Russian soldier. The 21-year-old tank commander stands accused of shooting a 62-year-old civilian a Ukrainian civilian, in the head through an open car window during the first week of the war. As Russia's war on the ground continues to plod along, Vladimir Putin's larger political ambitions for the war appear to have completely fallen apart. Putin's causus belli for this war, his justification for starting this nightmare in the first place, was at least partly about keeping NATO weapons off of Russia's border. But since the beginning of this war, NATO member countries have poured troops and weapons into the region to defend against potential Russian aggression. And now, as a direct result of Putin's invasion, Russia's border with NATO is poised to expand dramatically. Yesterday, the nation of Finland officially announced its plan to apply for NATO membership. And just today, Sweden's parliament released a report indicating it, too, may soon apply for NATO membership. Now, for context here, this is what the current NATO map looks like. In fact, you can't even see the top of it where the top of Russia uh, is, but Na Russia goes even to the top of that one. The NATO countries are the countries in bright green. You can see Finland and Sweden at the top of your map there are not in dark green. Now, Russia shares nearly 1,300 miles of border with NATO across Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. If Finland and Sweden were to join NATO, the Russia-NATO Russia border would more than double. Now, the push to join NATO by those two countries is far from a done deal. Joining NATO is a complicated matter. And just today, the Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan signaled that he may oppose letting Finland and Sweden into the military alliance. But the fact remains that nearly three months into this war, Vladimir Putin's plans to overtake Ukraine have stalled. And his plans to halt NATO expansion have backfired. Joining us now is the former U.S. ambassador to Russia, Michael McFaul. Ambassador, good to see you. I think back, I guess it was 79, 80, 81 days ago at the beginning of the war when you and I were talking. And at the time, uh, he doesn't talk about it as much anymore. At the time, Vladimir Putin had really uh, planted a flag around this idea of you, the West, forced us into this by continuing to push toward us with NATO expansion. I want no more NATO on my borders. This was a big excuse for going into Ukraine. This feels like a bad trade off for him. I think it is a bad trade off for him. In fact, I think he's lost the war in Ukraine already. He may win some battles. We don't know what's going to happen in Donbass. But if you go back to those original conversations we had, it, it feels like years ago, but I know it was just a few months ago. Uh, he's failed on all of his major military objectives. Remember, he was going to bring Ukraine in as part of Russia because they're not a separate people. That's failed. Denazification, that's failed. Demilitarization, that's failed taking the major cities, including Kiev, that's failed. Uh, and you're absolutely right. He said he was fighting NATO, and yet he has expanded NATO, and he has strengthened NATO as a result of this war in Ukraine. So on all of his major objectives that he himself defined, not me, he himself, mm -hmm. you can read it in his speech, he has failed to achieve. 
And if you're a reporter and you hear that the town hall is being raided, maybe your mind goes to corruption or graft or some kind of small town embezzlement scheme. These things happen at all levels of government. But that wasn't what this was. This was something weirder. The West Michigan Township, now part of a statewide investigation. Sources tell News 8 that Michigan State Police raided Irving Township Hall in Berry County this past Friday. This after someone was allegedly given improper access to voting machines. The investigation started here in Roscommon County. Michigan State Police say there, a third party allegedly was given unauthorized access to voter tabulation machines and data drives. State Police confirmed that investigation has since spread to several other counties in the state, but would not explicitly confirm if Irving Township in Barry County was on that list. However, News 8 sources say Irving Township Hall was raided Friday as a part of that investigation. State police raided the town hall, investigating whether someone was given unauthorized access to voting machines. The township supervisor later confirmed that a state police uh, that state police seized a voting tabulator in the raid and noticed the way the alleged alleged crime here was described. It's not that someone broke in to get at the voting machines and the data drives. It's that someone not authorized to have access to that stuff was allegedly given access. And what takes this story from being just a weird story of local interest to folks in Western Michigan to being a story of national importance is the fact that what I just described to you is happening all over the country. In Surrey County, North Carolina, a local Republican Party leader allegedly threatened to get a county elections director fired unless she helped him gain illegal access to voting equipment. In Lake County, Ohio, the FBI is investigating an attempted breach of the election system from the office of a local Republican commissioner on primary election day last year. In Colorado, a local Republican clerk was indicted on charges that she let an unauthorized person mess with election equipment that she was supposed to be protecting. Elsewhere in Michigan, three men gained access to and disassembled a voting machine after pretending to be from a fictitious government agency. A local Republican activist was arrested in that scheme. As of late last month, Reuters counted eight known incidents of unauthorized access or attempted unauthorized access to voting systems in five states since the 2020 election. Reuters reported, quote, all involved local Republican officeholders or party activists who advanced Donald Trump's stolen election falsehoods or conspiracy theories about rigged voting machines. And today, The Washington Post reports on yet another alleged breach. A former election supervisor in rural Coffee County, Georgia, tells The Washington Post that when she was in that elections post in the weeks after Donald Trump's loss in 2020, She let a bunch of election deniers poke around inside the county's election equipment because she hoped they could prove the election was rigged and that Joe Biden hadn't actually won. Never mind that Donald Trump won her county by 40 points. She told the Post that she was, quote, unaware of guidance the Georgia Secretary of State's office had sent to county election administrators, saying that voting equipment and software must not be released to the public absent a court order. And she questioned why access should be so restricted. She said, quote, I don't see why anything that is dealing with elections is not open to the public, end quote. It's kind of odd, right? Folks who are so concerned that people supposedly messed with election equipment to rig the last election now seem totally unfazed by the idea of random people walking in off the street and messing with election equipment. But in addition to that cheerful confession from the former election supervisor, the Post also obtained audio of the election denier that she says she allowed to access the equipment. He owns a bail bonds business, and business must be booming, because in this phone conversation, the Post obtained a recording of, the bail bonds guy says he chartered a plane to fly a crack team of election investigators to Coffee County, Georgia. I'm the guy that chartered the jet to go down to Coffee County to have them inspect all of those computers, and I've heard zero. Okay? Hmm. I went down there, we scanned every freaking ballot. They sent their team down to Coffee County, Georgia, and they scanned all the equipment, imaged all the hard drives, 
that scanned every single ballot, you know, absentee in person, in person, and absentee by mail, and have, have gotten no feedback. They imaged the hard drives? Yes. How in the world did you get permission to do that? We basically had the entire elections committee there. Okay. And they said, we give you permission. Go for it. Now, it is important to note here that the Georgia Secretary of State's office, which is investigating the situation, says so far they've found no evidence of a security breach. So it's possible that the bail bonds guy was exaggerating with what he and his ostensible team of investigators actually accomplished. But the fact remains that the local Republican election supervisor was an enthusiastic participant in this plan. She's one of many, many local Republican officials who are letting pro-Trump election deniers access sensitive election equipment, which is maybe the kind of behavior we ought to expect from Republican election officials in the current Republican Party, because the big lie about the 2020 election is now the foundational principle for Republican candidates up and down the ballot. We're now averaging 20,000 COVID hospitalizations a day. That's much lower than the peak that we hit during the Omicron spike last winter. It just about matches where we were last summer as Delta began to surge and sent patients to the hospital. COVID deaths are still trending slightly downward at the moment. A bit of a relief as we mark a total of 1 million dead from COVID this week in the United States. We've done a lot to defang this virus. This is not spring of 2020. We've got the tools we need to test, to treat, and to prevent the virus from overwhelming us. So this upward trend of cases and hospitalizations may not be all that alarming, at least not in the United States where testing hadn't tapered off or where social COVID protections hadn't dropped or where Congress had actually passed the funding needed for more vaccines, treatments, and tests and where we weren't all expecting an even bigger COVID wave in the fall. But unfortunately, we don't live in that United States. We live in this one, where the White House's recent multiple pleas for Congress to please pass COVID funding have gone unheeded. Why? Because of a lot of Republican senators who insist on retaining a public health measure that would continue to keep immigrants south of our border for no particular reason. They've hitched that public health measure to the COVID funding bill, and they're not letting up. But they are pretty severe consequences for not funding more COVID relief. According to Politico, the White House is now preparing to ration vaccines because this 50-50 Senate can't do its job and pass the funding for pandemic relief. As current funds run dry and additional money is stalled in the Senate, we might have to limit access to our next generation of potentially variant-specific vaccines. In other words, providing the, 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 the only uh, providing those vaccines only to those who are at the highest risk of severe illness and death. The reality is the $10 billion stuck in the Senate is stuck. Uh, it's just a starting point. That's only enough to pay our debt to Pfizer for its antiviral COVID treatment pills and to maintain our current levels of supplies of vaccines and tests through the end of the year. We'll need more money beyond the current funding in question. So how do we get past this log jam? And more importantly, what happens if we don't? Joining us now is Dr. Anthony Fauci, the nation's top infectious disease expert, President Biden's chief medical advisor, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Dr. Fauci, thank you for making time to speak with us tonight. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you, Ali. Good to be with you. Uh, let, let's understand this, this business about what happens if Congress continues to sit on this COVID relief funding that the White House has asked for. What, in your opinion, is at stake and, and how soon do we need to be worried about it? Well, it, it's going to be a real problem if we don't get the funding we asked for. And as you mentioned correctly, Ali, that's the minimum we're talking about. We need even more than that. And what's going to happen is that the vaccine, particularly the boosters against the variants that we're going to need, we're not going to have enough. The drugs that we need, the antivirals, we're not going to have enough. The tests, we're not going to have enough. These things are going to run out pretty quickly. And this is a very, well, first of all, it's an inopportune time to run out of funding no matter where you are. But particularly now, as we're starting to see, as you mentioned just a moment ago, on the introduction, we're seeing increase in cases. We're seeing increases in hospitalizations. This is not the time to pull back or not allow us to get the resources that we need. This is going to be a serious issue very soon if we don't get 
those resources. When we when you see these increases in hospitalizations, despite the fact uh, that we've got uh, antiviral treatments, we've got uh, vaccines out there, what does it tell you? Because on one hand, it looks like we're dealing with an attenuated uh, virus where where the effects on many people are not that severe. On the other hand, we're still dealing with numbers in the tens of thousands. It's remarkable. Well, Ali, you know, true, there, there's a, a significant amount of background immunity in the general community, resulting either from prior infection and recovery, and also from the number of people, not as many as we'd want, but a significant number of people, 67 percent of the population is fully vaccinated. But because we don't have a substantial proportion of those people boosted, even the good, hearty, robust immunity that we've had tends to wane over time. So we're seeing a conflation of issues. We're seeing a variant, a sublimit lineage of Omicron that has a transmission advantage. It transmits more readily. We're then seeing waning of immunity, and we're seeing a situation where we don't have as many people vaccinated as we'd like. And, and the hospitalizations and the deaths that you're seeing predominantly are among the vulnerable the elderly and those with underlying conditions. Sadly, even those who have been vaccinated. So there are a lot of things that we can do and we need to do. And unfortunately, in this country, compared to other countries that are developed and rich countries, the total proportion of people that have been vaccinated and boosted is below where we would like to see it. Put all those things together, and that's the reason why we're seeing this surging of cases. What do you how, how does this play out for you? Because what tends to happen here is right about that moment where everybody thinks we're out of this thing uh, and, and people decide they're going to go about their lives and go back to the office or, or, or drop some of their social distancing. We then see a new iteration, in this case, a, a sub iteration uh, of, of Omicron. How does this play out for you? Are you worried? Do you think this just peters out over time or are you worried that we do see a spike again in the fall? Well, we certainly have the possibility of a surge in the fall. And again, uh, Ali, it's going, to be, it's going to be related to a couple of conflating factors, because the fall is several months away. If we don't get people who've been boosted, to be, who've been vaccinated to be boosted, and getting the people who've not been vaccinated, we're going to have a degree of immunity that's below the level of what you want for the community protection across the country. Then you get a situation besides the waning of immunity, where as the weather gets cooler, people tend to congregate indoors. And we've seen very clearly a relaxation of some of the mitigation, where people are going to indoor congregate settings without masks. Now, masks are not required in so many places, but people mm -hmm. are not wearing masks, particularly when you have vulnerable people. You can get infected in yourself, get into serious trouble, or you could inadvertently bring it back perhaps to a household in which you have a vulnerable person, either an elderly person or someone who has an underlying condition that makes it more likely when they do get infected that they have a serious outcome. So we're concerned about all of those things. We're concerned about the surge we're seeing right now, as you mentioned, and the fact that as we approach the fall, the late fall and early winter, we're going to have a waning of immunity and circumstances, namely a lot of indoor activities, which make it very conducive to another surge. So is everybody who is qualified for a second booster, should everybody who's qualified be getting one now? Or do you hold off and wait till fall when it could become more serious? Uh, or do you think there'll be, a, is there a discussion of yet another booster? How does that all play out? Well, well, Ali, getting a booster now, if you are qualified or eligible, as it were, to get a booster, is not going to impede or get in the way of a good response if all of a sudden, as we get into the fall, there's the recommendation that everybody gets an extra shot. So right now, as we know, a few weeks ago, the FDA and the CDC made it very clear that people older than 50 years old are eligible for a boost with a particular emphasis on those who are quite old, in their 70s and older, and those who have underlying conditions. If those people get a boost now, and then as we get into the fall, namely the end of September, the beginning of October, and we need an extra boost, 
there's no contraindication for those people to also get another boost then. 